Well, John, I'm going to begin by asking if you could just explain the, the, the reasoning behind the word Nidiot and why you've decided to call this particular toll under that name. You keep looking at that me and not this me. Yeah. That, is, that one doesn't stare back. <laughs> um, well, uh, Nidiot is a, uh, a sort of reference to a joke out of my last tour about whether you say an onion or an onion, which uh, it was the joke that annoyed most people. So I thought that would be the one to carry forward onto the next one. So uh, I've decided I call myself an idiot a lot, but I don't think I'm an idiot, so maybe I'm at an idiot. Uh -huh. So I've decided that at an idiot is someone who thinks too much rather than not enough. And if you just boil that down to a sort of pithy one-liner, then it's a really good idea. Yeah. And why the squirrel? Um, well, something about that poster <laughs> suggested smugness to me when I saw it. So I decided that a squirrel would sort of offset the smugness um, and just make me look a little bit less like a, a punchable twerp. Um, um, and I think it does the job. You think? Yeah. You wouldn't punch a guy with a squirrel on his shoulder, no. would you? Whereas if I didn't have that squirrel, I imagine you'd have rugby tackled that poster down by now. <laughs> and is there a, a particular theme in this stand-up? Do, do you try to have a kind of particular running theme that runs through your sort of tour? Um, I try to, yeah, just so that one story goes into the next one. So yeah, this one is, is about me trying to um, be less uptight, I guess. Think a bit less about life and do a bit more and try and be a bit happier. Because yeah. I mean, part of your act in the past has been quite sort of self-deprecating. It's that kind of the life of a single man sort of routine, I suppose. Yeah. But that's sort of no longer the case. So if you had to kind of alter the way you approach comedy as a result? Well, I've had to change the uh, jokes from being about me getting annoyed with myself to getting annoyed with my girlfriend. And it's been surprisingly easy. Um, yeah, I've just transferred that. I've gone very much back to the comedy of the 70s um, and it's been, it's been an absolute godsend. There's so much material to be had. And does she go to see you live very often? Did she go to many shows <coughs> on your tour? She's been to a couple, yeah. She's not really a fan, um, <laughs> so she's been to a couple, but then she's, she's more of a sort of Peter Kay fan. Mm. Fair enough. And uh, do you think that the, the, sort of the older you get and the more sort of well-versed in life uh, you are, that your comedy sort of improves? Because I suppose in some regards you've got more to talk about. Oh, I would hope so, yeah, but that's not really for me to say. It, it makes me look weird if I sit here saying, do you know, I think I've really improved. <laughs> I hope I've got better, and I hope I get better again. I'm certainly not finished. I don't think, you know, I mean, this is great. It's really good, but, you know, it's not me saying, that's perfect, by the way. That is, stand-up doesn't get any better than that. And because, uh, I mean, you've always been quite sort of, sort of earnest and quite honest in your routine. You sort of explore your own sort of personal life and obviously of course the sort of OCD and stuff mm. like that. Uh, what do you think, uh, I was just wondering, what do you think it is about sort of making light of, of quite serious situations in some regards that, that you think has served you so well in your career? Because uh, everyone's as miserable as I am, I think. Everyone who goes to comedy is going there because something's not right in their life, obviously. So I think if you, uh, if you tackle a few issues and if you can turn uh, negative things into a positive, that's a sort of, uh, it's a very British thing, I think, to complain and have everything be terrible, but to laugh about it. I think it's quite fundamental. And if you didn't laugh about the terrible things in your life, then they'd just be terrible. And in regards to the, the tour, what's your, is there one particular night that stands out more than others, or one sort of city or, or venue that you most enjoy playing at? Um, no, not really. This tour in general has been, we've been very lucky. We've been to some amazing theatres, uh, like Leeds Grand Theatre. Uh, where they left the guest book out for me to sign and I'd like Charlie Chaplin in it and Morecambe and Wise. Felt really proud of what I do. Uh, yeah, knowing that you're playing the same venue as Morecambe and Wise, walking out and telling a load of jokes about snooker and touching yourself. Um, but we've been to some amazing places, Edinburgh Playhouse and Glasgow and Dublin and Belfast. I've been very lucky. So I've really tried to enjoy this one because, you know, who knows when it will end. And talking of, sort of more common wise, have you got one particular comedian or comedy act that sort of stands out as your biggest inspiration? Uh, Lee Evans is my biggest inspiration in terms of, you know, being a sort of teenager watching comedy and knowing that that's what I wanted to do. He's the one that I thought, if I could do that for a living, that'd be amazing. Uh, at the moment, it's Louis C.K., the American comic. He's the one that I, if I could be half as good as him, I'd be very happy. How's your stamina compared to Lee Evans? Uh, oh, terrible, terrible. No, I, I, I mean, I sometimes wear a shirt for two gigs in a row. So there you go, that's not really an option for him. Um, he gets quite sweaty. He does get a little bit sweaty, yeah. But I find with a good bit of uh, antiperspirant, I'm pretty sure I could get through a whole tour. I don't really sweat, I don't really work, you see. 
not one for moving. And uh, in regards to sort of touring, I mean, we kind of, I guess we kind of take it for granted, but it must be such a ridiculously tiring experience because it is obviously doing the show every night, but the traveling as well, it must be quite tough. I think it's the hardest job in the country. I think I could say that. And I think firefighters and nurses would agree with that. I think, um, you know, they're very lucky to have me do what I do, I think. Uh, it is, you know, it's, it's hard, but then it's, you do it because you want to. So I don't, the minute I start complaining about it, the minute I'll start feeling sorry for myself. And then I'll have another tour. That's a great <laughs> idea, actually. Right, that's the next year's tour sorted. How hard I am. Probably not that. I'll reword that title. And because it's uh, such a kind of a tough experience, do you find that it's also the most fulfilling aspect of your career as well? Yeah, absolutely. Stand up is yeah, it's, it's my favourite thing that I do because it's it's hard. So when you know you can't you can't trick a thousand people in a room. Uh, so if you've done well, then you you know you've earned it. And I'm you know, when I look back, I'll be I'll be proud of so playing those theatres I've done this year, and we recorded the DVD at Hammersmith Apollo where I've seen like all my idols have played there. That's you know you can't help but get a little bit back slappy because yeah, I mean I, I mean how are you as well with sort of heckling do you get many hecklers in the crowd not really a heckle tends to be someone pointing out sort of weaknesses in your act and I, I always aim to get there before the audience so I've sort of acknowledged all my frailties before they have a chance I get people joining in which I quite I don't mind that I don't mind if people want to shout out someone threw some knickers at me on this tour people just shout out bars they've been in it's all good fun did you keep the knickers I did keep the knickers, yeah, because I didn't. It felt rude to sort of kick them back into the audience, but I didn't want to touch them because I didn't know if they were clean. Yeah. So I sort of got the mic stand and sort of looped them up and flung them off stage, and then got a carrier bag. A bit like picking up dog poo in a way, I suppose. Very much like yeah. that, yeah. Oddly similar, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where she'd gotten. <laughs> and um, I was wondering as well. I mean, you've been doing this for a number of years now. Do you still get quite nervous before going on stage? Do you still get those sort of butterflies every time you're about to perform in front of a big crowd? I always get nervous, yeah, because you know you should never forget that it can, you know, it can go wrong. If you're not trying, then at some point people will realise that. And you know, I think out of respect for the job, you should care enough to get a bit nervous. But I've tried to. It's not as bad as it used to be. I mean, it used to be. I used to drink five pints before I went on, but those days are gone. Just four now. Yeah, just down to four and a couple yeah. of Jaeger bombs. <laughs> So, of course, when you sort of do a long tour, I mean, the, the, the show will change it will every sort of night, but it's the sort of same structure. How yeah. do you go about keeping sort of things fresh for yourself and to keep yourself kind of, you know, not so that you don't get bored your, your, on your, yourself that you're able yeah. to do it? Yeah, it's nice to have a couple of bits that are different every night. So I always have a couple of bits that mean I have to go into the audience and that means those are always new. And uh, for the rest of it, you just remind yourself that no one there has seen it before. So as much as you might know what's happening, They've still paid their money and organised babysitters and, you know, driven. So you should perform it. It's always new. Every room sounds different and looks different and anything might happen. So it, it tends not to be a problem live. And I was wondering as well, when you know it's DVD night, do you approach it any differently to how you would any other night? Yeah, you can't help. I try not to, you know, because it is still, the DVD is a recording of a live show. So you should perform it as you would, but you can't help but get a little bit worried about the fact that you know that this will be available forever and you know you try and I, I tend to try and be a bit more eloquent a bit more Shakespearean in my language so that if they find the DVD in 200 years they'll think I was really smart so if for some reason you were to to do the show that was for the DVD and you weren't quite happy enough with it are you in a position where you can say scrap that we'll do it tomorrow night or is it sort of too late no because tomorrow night is Ipswich or Dundee or and it means you know people have real jobs packing up sets and carrying cameras and yeah no you get one go at it and that's it which in a way is a sort of it's a help because I think if you could keep doing it you would just carry on because it would never be perfect enough so something about being told it's being filmed tonight do it as well as you can and then you just have to put it out there and then it's done then. And do you think that uh, sort of the present day is about as good a time as it's ever been to be a comedian in, in Britain because there's, there's a kind of the variety of different sort of stand-up sort of shows you get across the sort of channels and obviously the panel shows. It seems that there's more opportunities for, for upcoming comedians than there ever has been. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, if it's the best time. It's certainly, I mean, I'm not going to complain about what's happened to me. I've had a very uh, lucky deal. So yeah, I think for for the comedians at the at the upper echelons, it's it's good. 
but there's a consequence to that which means that you know being a club comic perhaps isn't as easy and there's a there's a dearth of comedians maybe uh getting good work on the club circuit so you know but i mean i'm doing all right so screw him <laughs> so how uh, how sort of vital was that sort of eight out of ten cats when you became the sort of captain of, of one of the teams how, how vital was that to your own career in terms of exposure uh yeah that was essential really yeah getting a being on telly sort of every week and being given a repeated chance to be funny so that people sort of get used to you is, is very good. It gives you a chance to, I think if you're on a panel show once, you have to just do jokes. But if you're on a series, you get a chance to put your personality across. And that's what's good for people, I think, get to know you on something like 8 out of 10 Cats. So they feel more confident going to see you live rather than if they've just seen you once and maybe don't know what you do. Whereas now, I think, I mean, not only do people know me, they're actually tired of me and exhausted by my opinions. And Because, I mean, 8 out of 10 cat, Cats does Countdown. has been a sort of huge success. What, what, what other sort of TV uh, show would you most like to tackle on the 8 out of 10 Cats format? Um, well, I've put in a request for 8 out of 10 Cats does The Crystal Maze. Oh. But that, they, they, well, I think they'd have to rebuild the set and uh, resurrect uh, Richard O'Brien from wherever he's been hiding. I've, I've, I will not do it with Ed Tudor Paul. There's just no point. If you're going to do it, do it properly. That's what I say. But I'll pretty much do anything. It turns out I'm much better at word games than I am at comedy. So any quizzes they can get me on, I'll take. And because I mean, recently there was obviously the, the great show you did with Matt Ford on, on the Channel Four series, which was quite intimate at times. And there was obviously there was one sort of sequence with yourself and your mother, which was quite touching to watch. Are you able to watch that back, or is that can that be almost a bit too? Difficult sometimes. Um, some of that documentary is better because there's other people and there's scenery. I can't watch my stand-up back because it's just me and it feels a bit onanistic. It feels slightly unpleasant. But the documentary I watched back because I was proud of it. I was proud of some of the bits we did I thought were, were good telly. So, yeah, I, I watched a bit of that. So do you ever laugh at your own jokes if, if you ever do catch yourself on, on telly? Um... No, I don't laugh at the jokes. I laugh at the face that I realise I've pulled after a joke is more often what makes me laugh when I think I've sort of looked really cool and off into the distance and I realise I've pulled a smug, punchable, aren't I clever little face. That yeah. makes me laugh. I was just wondering so if you plan on doing anything else with Matt Ford on the telly. No, no, he had his chance and he blew it <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. He failed to drive the camper van properly and he sexually assaulted me. Um, and that's really two strikes too many I think so good luck to the lad I wish him all the best he's got a lot of issues that he needs to sort of address before I'll work with him again yeah. it looks like he does a good barbecue though uh, yeah he does if you're if you're a vegetarian it's a real treat to watch someone enjoy sausages and bacon while you eat a pickled onion sandwich <laughs> yeah that's fair enough um, of course, Christmas is when uh, a lot of the sort of stand-up comedians across the country bring out their, their live DVD. Mm. I was just wondering, why should they pick yours this Christmas? Um, oh, that is a hard question, and one I should have probably prepared an answer to. If they're a fan of me, then that would be a good reason. Um, if there's some sort of two for £20 offer on, I don't know if you get those anymore, then you can sort of hedge your bets a little bit. Um, if they're like squirrels, uh, there's no squirrels in the show. But that's nice, isn't it, that one? Mm. Um, and just because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. You know, I'm, quite, I'm all right, you know. I pay my taxes, I work hard. I just, I just, just don't be a dick about it. Just be nice to me. Why wouldn't you buy it? Why are you asking that? Who isn't buying it? Just, what else is available? Well, that was going to be my next question. If there was two oh, for 20 really? pounds. Who, who, if, 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 people had, if people already owned your DVD, they had it, they loved it, they thought it was the best. Of course they did, of course they did. Why but they wanted to, to supplement it with, with another. Which right. would you recommend? Who, which I other would really the just buy like? another copy of mine yeah. because if you love it that much, it's going to get worn out. And it's good to have one for best and one for guests. That's what I say. Um, that's my catchphrase. And then what I do with DVDs I love is I tend to give them away. So like things I like, I say, oh, you've got to watch that, and they never come back. So actually, I would probably say you're going to need about six or seven. And then you're at a position to maybe think about buying another DVD, but not before you own seven copies of mine. I think that's fair. That's fair enough. I think that's fair. Yeah. So obviously, recently, I mean, because you are becoming one of the sort of the country's most renowned comics, how do you cope? Do you get recognised on the street often, and how do you sort of cope with that side of things? I do get recognised quite a lot. 
uh, but fortunately people think I'm Gino De Campo. <laughs> so I tell them that I'm opening a restaurant nearby and that I can't tell them any more about it. And then they tend to leave me alone. Um, one guy came up to me in my local and said, you're my favorite comedian, what's your name again? So that sort of thing keeps the guy grounded. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been in the same room as Gino De Campo? No, no, I haven't. I mean, Luckily, we, we work in different spheres. <laughs> he tends to, uh, he, he does a different kind of work to me. Yeah. So would you, would you consider getting involved in kind of Strictly or, or doing any of these kind of celebrity sort of reality TV shows that, that exist? been involved in? I mean, I wouldn't do <laughs> it, but you know, if, if you know, some camera work came up or a bit of audience work or something like that, I might, uh, catering, I'd do <laughs> catering on it. Can you dance? Uh, no, no, I oh. cannot. No, and uh, I've no will to learn. <laughs> I feel the same sort of urge to dance when I hear music as I do to sing when I see a sandwich. Just doesn't, just <laughs> doesn't occur to me at all. And in regard, in back to the, the, the Nidiot live show, is there a particular, um, not joke, but kind of sequence or, or kind of story that you tell that you, you sort of, you most enjoy telling or that you always feel gets the best reaction out of the... Um, the, the, the last sort of 10, 15 minutes are my favourite, um, which doesn't say a lot. But um, that's when I start talking about sort of being in a relationship. And that's the bit I was most nervous about. I thought if I stop being single, I'll run out of material. And then, actually, I think that's my favourite bit now. So, um, yeah, I would say that. So if you get the DVD, just fast forward to about <laughs> the last 10 minutes. And is there much else in, in, in terms of sort of extras and, and behind the scenes or anything like that? It, can fans sort of be treated to anything like that on this DVD? Yes, there's a, a DVD commentary, which I did last time with uh, a young comic called Matt Ford. Um, I've heard of him. Yes, he's, uh, I gave him one last chance. Um, but he kept having to uh, nip out, actually. He's got a sort of bladder complaint. So while we were doing the commentary, he kept having to leave and various uh, politicians popped in. Uh, and I did some of the DVD commentary with Tony Blair. Uh, Diane Abbott popped up, ever popular figure there. You, if you want the kids to buy a DVD, you've got to get Diane Abbott. Yeah. That's what I say. Um, and Nigel Farage offered his views on uh, the stand-up comedian, John Richardson. So that's on the DVD. <laughs> Enjoy that. So what, what's, what's uh, keeping you busy at the moment? Are you touring right now? Have you got, you, have you got many live shows in the near future? Yes. Uh, I'm going to Dartford when we finish talking. Uh, and then I've still got to go to... Uh, still got to do the hometown gig of my uh, girlfriend, uh, which means I've got to have a real think about what material I do. Her family going to be there? Her granddad's going to be there, yeah. So certain sexual routines will be... Uh, reduced if not edited out completely. I mean, the whole show could potentially be about half an hour long. But, you know, at least no one will get upset, except everyone, except her granddad. So when, you, when you're touring uh, the country and you go to places like Dartmouth or any, anywhere, really... Um, Dartmouth? It, did you say Dartford? I said Dartford, yeah, oh, but right. I would like to go to Dartmouth. Dartmouth sounds nice as well. I've been to Dartmouth. Oh. Yeah, it's lovely. You've got to get a ferry. Oh, really? Yeah, it's nice. Do they have a venue there that you can... They had a theatre there, yeah. It was it was quite a, an elderly crowd. I was driving a Ford car at the time and the lights kept going off while I was driving. I had to punch the dashboard to get the lights to come back on. They were great days. Because I, I, um, I read Stuart Lee's uh, book about, kind of, which he sort of discusses uh, touring. And, and it, it sounds like it can be quite a, a, a lonely experience. How, how do you find it? Because, I mean, it's, you spend a, it seems to be spend a lot of time in the car on the motorway. That, that's the impression I got anyway. You do, but you know, you've got, uh, there's talk radio, isn't there? There are some fine uh, DJs who do uh, talk shows. Can't think of any now. Certainly not sort of late night on a Friday. But, um, you know, there's talk radio. There's an audio box for an absolute godsend. I have a lot of audio books. Stephen King gets me through a lot of touring. Uh, and I talk to myself quite a lot. And I drink heavily. So that, you know. That's just before you get in the car? Just generally, just yeah. throughout, just throughout. Don't drink and drive. Um, but I, I don't mind it, I like to. I like being on my own, because nobody touches stuff. And do you get to see the places you visit? So say you, you go to Newcastle, do you actually get to spend a night or a day sort of looking at the city? And Not really, no. There's a lot of places we sort of arrive in the dark and then leave the next morning. Um, I mean, I've heard there are comedians who go out after their gigs but I know that's very irresponsible. I like to get back and, you know, ideally I'm back in time for match of the day. And then uh, in bed by 12, up at eight, healthy breakfast, back on the road. 
That's fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, so just finally, what's your favourite joke ever? Oh, favourite joke ever. That's yeah. hard. Um, or that you can think of right now. The only joke I can think of right now is two old people in church and the woman leans over to her husband and says, what should I do? I just did a silent fart. And he says, I think you should turn your hearing aid up. That's the only <laughs> joke I can think of at the moment. Well, it's not, maybe not the best ever, but it was good enough for now. No, it? it's up there, isn't it? <laughs> Top five. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time It's today. been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey you guys!